Hello, welcome to the Friday, October 15th, 2021 edition of the Sands and Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich, and today I'm recording from Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. One of the ways how SSH is often used is to forward ports, and that's, of course, quite a useful feature. For example, you have some admin console that only listens on loopback, and you need to access it remotely. But in particular, on Windows systems, you don't necessarily have SSH enabled, and Xavier has written a quick diary with an interesting workaround here, and that's the use of a NetShell. NetShell, of course, uh, the command to configure various network properties on Windows, and it has an interesting property here, the port proxy, that can be used uh, sort of like SSH to forward uh, connections. One big difference, of course, SSH also encrypts the data. Uh, this does not encrypt the data, but uh, for a quick uh, debugging or maybe as part of a pen test or so, uh, this uh, may suffice and, of course, a lot simpler than having to install SSH on the particular system. And for the exact command line, of course, refer to Xavier's uh, diary. And on Wednesday, I did write a quick diary about these ubiquitous uh, brute force attempts against mail servers that are really all not that dangerous. Uh, so, well, a uh, little bit sarcasm here, of course. I focused more on how to improve the brute forcing tool than how to defend against it. Defending against these kind of tools should be relatively straightforward. Well, audit your passwords and, of course, try to use two-factor authentication. In the case of uh, email servers, two-factor authentication doesn't always uh, work that great. So you may need uh, some uh, application-specific password or so that's system generated in order uh, to avoid uh, users creating weak passwords. The password lists and the username lists commonly used by these tools are fairly straightforward, fairly simple. And that's, of course, another thing that you can do is audit your users' passwords to make sure they're not using a password that's on the list. Ad blockers in browsers are very popular uh, because, well, uh, ads are often also used to spread malicious uh, content and not always just annoying. Two researchers from Imperva, Johan Silam and Ron Massas, did, however, come across an interesting ad blocker called uh, All Block that, well, it doesn't actually block ads, uh, but it injects its own ads instead of the ads that you would usually find. Of course, the problem with this is not just that, well, its software doesn't really do what it's supposed to do, but you can only imagine that the advertisers that are advertising via somewhat illegitimate channels like this are more likely going to actually place malicious advertisements than you would have found before. So in many ways, it may actually make your browsing experience much worse. Browser extensions are, well, just like uh, so much other software, make sure what you install, uh, make sure you're installing it from reputable sources. And of course, don't fall for typo squatting or other tricks that uh, attackers may use to trick you into installing uh, their malicious software or browser add-on. And in general, Less browser add-ons is usually better than more. So from time to time, go through your browser add-ons and see which ones you'll actually need and use. And well, what better way to trick a victim into doing pretty much anything than a romance scam? And the latest trick here, according to Sophos, is romance scams that are tricking victims into installing a fake uh, cryptocurrency trading apps on their iPhones. Now, you may say, how can this happen with an iPhone, given that uh, iPhones can only download applications directly from uh, the App Store? Well, uh, there are exceptions, and that usually comes into play if your iPhone is enrolled into a mobile device management platform. 
Using these platforms, enterprises are able to install their own internal applications on users' devices, and that's the mechanism being used here. In order to then install these applications, the victim first has to install a profile. And I think uh, when you ever went to the profile installation process, it's not always that obvious uh, to the layperson what that actually does. But what it really means is you're now trusting this other root certificate that can be used to sign software, and that software can then be installed on your phone. So interesting trick, and of course, the goal of these fake cryptocurrency trading apps is to just steal all of your money. And well, given that this podcast is really sort of covering two days, I want to summarize a couple other items just quickly. First of all, Microsoft released a Linux version of the Windows Sysmon tool. Sysmon, of course, extremely popular to better monitor your systems. It's certainly worthwhile looking at it if you're already familiar with Sysmon on Windows. Also, Foxit, the alternative PDF viewer, released an update that fixes some vulnerabilities. And so that VMware, VMware's vRealize and vRealize Orchestrator uh, applications were updated. Nothing critical here, but still it could be used to redirect victims uh, to uh, websites. That, of course, can then often be used, for example, for phishing or to impersonate trusted websites. Well, uh, that's it for today. Thanks again for listening and talk to you again on Monday. Bye.